it up first and uh, pledge of allegiance. The flag. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to start off with our superintendent's report. Thank you. Uh, I just want to note that our student liaison, Chris, very nice email. He's unable to be here tonight. Some demands around college admissions are popping up this week, and I told him to take care of that business. So he will be here in um, in January. Um, so let's see. Tonight, I just wanted to bring to your attention that we are in the process of revising the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding between the State Department and the Police Department, and um, the impetus for that really is a change in the law state law, um, Massachusetts passed a criminal justice reform um, law last spring, and that law included new requirements for MOUs between schools and police departments. And um, it, the MOU now has to address particular roles and functions of the school resource officer. So um, we have taken a look at a model MOU that is in place for districts to consider that came out from the Attorney General's Office and the Department of Education. And I've compared that to our existing MOU. I've had um, our legal counsel review everything and give me her input and met with Chief Silva, sort of discuss what needs to happen. So we're kind of uh, taking a look at a draft at the moment and hopefully in the next week or so be able to, to finalize something. It, it seems to me that though we will have to make some changes to the language and what is included in the MOU, I don't think that those changes really reflect a, a, much of a change in practice or certainly not a change in how we kind of think of the role of the SRO already, but we need to, to codify it. Um, when you look at the, the requirements under the law, I'll give you an example of the kind of thing that they're getting at here. It's, it's clear to me that whatever changes are happening are in response to some concern that has cropped up somewhere at some point, right? So uh, language that's required. It needs to say, under state law, the SRO shall not serve as a school disciplinarian, as an enforcer of school regulations, or in place of school-based mental health providers and the SRO shall not use police powers to address traditional school discipline issues, including nonviolent disruption. And I read that and I think, yes, I mean, we never would suggest otherwise, um, but I imagine that that's a concern in some way. So we're working on that. Next, I just wanted to give you a quick update on where we are with the development of the FY20 budget. So our cost center leaders submitted their budget request to us right before Thanksgiving. And we've had some individual discussions with those folks. And then in central office, we compiled all those requests and reviewed it, um, had <coughs> excuse me, sort of an initial meeting about it. Last week, I think, last week we met as a district leadership team with our administrative council and ran through a process to all see everybody's requests collectively to understand um, where those requests were coming from, to go back to our district improvement strategy, think about some of the things we're working on, and really to start to make some choices and to identify some priorities as a team. I think that was a, a good process. Um, it's a fantastic team, honestly, and they really do take a pre-K-12 perspective. We had a lot of discussion, kind of divided into groups, and what we found is that there's consensus around what the priorities are and what the choices are that need to be made. Um, so that was helpful. We did discuss the input that school committee gave us about your priorities as well. So. What we heard from you last month was um, a focus on middle school curriculum leadership. I think we're in agreement. You'll see that reflected in our proposed budget. Um, we've been talking about this issue of is there a way to expand elementary coping? We're 
talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, we are examining library staffing at the elementary level and comparing it to our EE. And then we also heard an issue about continuing to address um, the learning needs of students with disabilities, particularly in middle school science. So all of those things we heard and we are um, trying to address. So we've had several follow-up meetings in the central office and we have a final meeting with the Administrative Council next week. And I think at that point we'll be ready to start putting pen to paper and be ready to present something in January. In the meantime, the other moving part here is um, our conversations with the municipal side. So there is a budget steering committee that includes people from Town Hall and us. Charlie, Heath, and I met with budget steering again just yesterday, two days ago. I'm losing track, yeah. but sometime this week. We're always we, together. We're always together. <laughs> um, so we, we met with them just to get a sense of sort of the financial picture, um, you know, big picture, <laughs> and um, how we're moving forward, and just to stay in communication about what we're all thinking so that we can all hit our marks together and there are no ugly surprises later on in the process. Um, you know, as is similar to the last couple of years, they've kind of indicated that a 3% increase I think would be a nice target for us. Um, that's an increase that feels sustainable moving forward. Um, you know, I would take this opportunity to remind everybody that we haven't had an operational override in Westwood since FY08, which is pretty remarkable. There were some tough years back around FY10, 11, 12, where we had, I think, a 0% increase, a 1% increase, right? Those were lean. And then we got a big boost to the base a couple of years ago in FY16, 17, when the new revenue from University Station came online, those were like five and six percent increases. The last two years, the school department came in at 3.3 and 3.4. And I think we're on track to be in that neighborhood again. I don't think we can come in at three. I think we can come in at four. We'll call that three ish. Right? Um, so we'll be presenting. And if any of the committee members are interested in you know, okay. what the town is saying, we'd be happy to share it with you. And, uh, much of the weeds you want to get into, what they've been sharing with us, you know, projections and rates of taxes and uh, things coming in from the University Station. But if, that's, if you have an interest, then we'd be happy to share that with you. Yeah. I think we're in a very good place right now with our relationship um, on this issue. I think everybody's working in a really transparent and open collaborative way. So. Um, They've been very supportive, yeah. you know, of what we're doing. Also, keeping an eye on construction coming down the road sometime. And so, you know, I think it's very supportive of what we're trying to do. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. When you have the input, a couple of initiatives. Mm -hmm. One was the security and the other was mm -hmm. the social emotional curriculum review. Do you have that input in time for January? Yeah, we do. So, the yeah. social emotional curriculum <clears throat> review has or is wrapping up. Yeah, we, we've got a couple of meetings on the books to wrap up in January, but um, in terms of budget impact, we actually think we can take the, the initial steps that we're going to need within our current operating budget. Um, we will likely be looking at, sort of a year down the road, some potential staffing impact, but for this year, um, the, the recommendations are going to fall along the lines of training, um, really trying to build our skill set before we bring in more people. Yeah. The security audit, unfortunately, the answer is I don't know that we are going to have that completed in time to finalize the budget. And so, um, you know, the way that the warrant article was, was um, presented last spring, whatever the differences between the cost of the audit and what was appropriated can be used to start implementing recommendations. And there is going to be some in here, not a lot. Um, but, you know, if there were something that we had to really do kind of immediately, we could try to hop. But I don't, I don't think we are going to have a report time, unfortunately. So. Any other questions? Uh, um. Okay, great. Um, all right. So next, I'm actually going to turn it over for a couple minutes to Steve yeah. and Allison, but I don't know how. I think it's Steve. Mostly, mostly, mostly Steve. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop. Allison, <coughs> you can jump in. Hi, everyone. Um, so, um, under Emily's leadership, 
over the uh, summer, we, uh, we released the strategy for district improvement. And that document has uh, four objectives, one of which is meaningful, meaningful learning experiences, which is at the head of this, this slide. And for each of the learning objectives, there are three priorities. So for this objective, I've listed two of the priorities. And I've selected those two because they tie in directly with this uh, action step, which are embedded within these priorities, called Investigate Options for Expanding Coding and Maker Spaces at the Elementary Level. So uh, that's what I'm here to talk about. Is I want to make sure it's clear that it's aligned with uh, the district's goals and strategy for this year and beyond. Um, so uh, one of the reasons why this was something that we decided we wanted to some attention to is we had a very successful first year with the third grade coding special last year. Uh, we did some parent uh, surveys, we surveyed students. Uh, it was overwhelming support for the program. And uh, when I asked the question about whether or not uh, there would be interest in expanding coding to grades four and five, there was overwhelming interest which is good, it's also a challenge because now we have to figure out how to do that. And uh, speaking of challenges, uh, as we look at expanding coding, there are some inherent challenges with doing that at the elementary level. For example, um, there's uh, schedule challenges, there are time constraints, and there are just competing demands. So we were able to get the third grade coding special to work uh, largely because we were able to find some special time and move some things around to really essentially create a dedicated uh, segment of time for all third graders to attend the special. Uh, in fourth and fifth, we have uh, the music program kind of ramps up, and that, that opportunity just doesn't present itself. So we are, we're looking for ways uh, to, again, expand coding in grades four and five to give some continuity as kids go to the middle school, so they have a lot of prerequisite skills uh, for lots of things at the middle school, including the engineering and computer science curriculum. Um, so the logical place to start was with the ITCs, partly because they're doing coding in grade three, but they're also doing it in lots of other grades, pretty much every other grade. Stephen Smith, that right, ITC is? Instructional Technology Coach. And we have one. Uh, we have Mary Comer from Michigan School <laughs> and Martha Jones uh, here. So uh, she does some great work at both of those schools and she does the coding um, at the Sheehan School. So the ITCs and uh, the library media specialists have been doing a lot of work already with maker spaces, which is really a broad term for making things. It could be building circuits. It could be taking a toaster apart and trying to figure out what, what makes it work or building something out of construction paper or cardboard or sticks or whatever it may be. So it's a, it's a very inquiry-based, hands-on kind of experience for kids. And in fact, the work that the ITCs are doing with the coding, and then the work that the uh, library media specialists do with Makerspace is really dovetailed nicely. And so we really want to see how we can kind of bring those two groups together to uh, identify ways we can kind of uh, address this, this desire to, to move beyond and, and get this experience in grades four and five. So um, we brought both groups together uh, during the no November 7th uh, release day uh, to brainstorm ideas. Uh, and we came out of that meeting with, with several ideas. Um, and I wanted to kind of list three things that we're thinking about. So the first is, um, to essentially ask the ITCs and librarians to collaborate and try to come up with some experiences where the, both groups are providing them for students during the library time in either grade four or grade five. So they're working on that now. We're essentially piloting it this year. So I'll give you two examples. Uh, again, one is from Mary. Uh, she's working on, at the Sheehan School, uh, the Dewey Dash which is uh, programming a robot to find a particular book based on the Dewey system. Uh, but it also includes measurement and in a, in a, a direct connection to um, math standards in the curriculum. So there's a lot going on here, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out. Uh, 
whenever it, it comes to fruition. But that's something that they're working on. Um, another one is a grade four at Martha Jones. Uh, there's a book series called Choose Your Own Adventure, um, where apparently, I just learned this today, the reader assumes the role of the protagonist and makes choices to determine the main character's actions, actions and the plot's outcome. And so building on this very popular children's series, from what I understand, uh, the ITC and Martha Jones and librarian are working on using Scratch, the programming language, um, to essentially create one of these choose your own adventure projects with the kids. So, is that still popular? Choose your own adventure. I was like 1978. Oh, I'm so old. I haven't been reading it so long. Yeah. So, I wasn't it. reading them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, so then that's just two examples of a number of things that are being worked on. We're going to take a look at that over the course of the year, see how it plays out. So Steve, those lessons will be implemented during fourth grade library class? Is that Correct. what I heard you say? Or potentially fifth grade. Or so fifth grade. Whatever okay. seems appropriate and works out. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one thing, that collaboration <coughs> during library time. Um, we also have four kind of content specific release days this year for all of elementary, uh, science, math, a number of things, and I think two of them have happened already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one, one has happened already. One has happened. The second's coming up in January. Right. So in the spring, uh, we have a fifth grade teacher at Downey, and then the ITC at Downey that are going to be offering the course during that time titled Code Beyond a Third Grade Special. And we have a number of fourth and fifth grade teachers that will uh, attend that. The goal of that uh, professional development is to give the fourth and fifth grade teachers um, the experience as a student, what it's like to be in a coding class, and also for them to see how some of these ideas can be incorporated directly into the curriculum. Because honestly, I think that if there's a way to get it into the curriculum that it's just a two for one. You know, it's supporting the curriculum, but it's also giving kids opportunities to have these learning experiences. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is to kind of pull together some educators, most likely ITCs and librarians, over the summer to debrief this work um, and look towards scaling things up a little more for 2019, 2020. So I envision some professional development uh, over the or curriculum time over the summer where uh, some PD is developed for next fall and some curriculum materials as well to see how we can try to start embedding this work in the classroom itself. So there's a lot to be seen, but we're going to take a lot of notes this year and, and kind of with an eye towards uh, scaling this up um, for, for the following school year. Um, all of this really falls under this, um, what you see on the screen, this idea of authentic student-centered learning. Um, these, the coding and the maker spaces are just fertile ground for that kind of experience. But there are other experiences um, in, in Westwood that address those same ideas. And I'm going to turn it over to Allison because she has some really interesting examples. Uh, the first screen, this is just a picture of coding, um, so I won't say too much about that, but this is um, students in Deerfield uh, working on the Lego robots. Uh, the program is on the Chromebook, and they use uh, Bluetooth connectivity to essentially send the program down to the, to the Lego robot and tell it to do whatever the program says it needs to do. Uh, so then again, that's just one example of what it looks like uh, to be in a coding class in fourth grade. And then the other slides, Allison? Yeah, I wanted to uh, incorporate a couple additional things that give you a sense of what some of the inquiry-based instruction that looks like is, looks like outside of coding in the library, too. So um, all over the district, we have these classroom laboratories cropping up. And this is also an initiative rolling out of some professional development we're doing this year where uh, teachers are setting aside a small part of, the, part of the classroom that kids can visit during transition time just to sort of uh, explore a particular question. So the question on the left side of the, the page here is, the, you know, how do you make um, a homemade thermometer? So these are all sort of uh, examples of 
things kids have sort of put together. Uh, on the right side is after you pick a plant, is it still alive? Is the question. And they're you know experimenting with that. So these are just little setups in the back of the class. Kids pop in and out um, uh, at various points during the day. Um, and it's an opportunity to sort of expand beyond the, the general curriculum. Uh, the next slide uh, shows kind of some of this work is going on at the middle school as well. Our seventh grade science classrooms are uh, involved in a Harvard uh, University forest study uh, in the woods outside of Thurston Middle School. So they're actually going out to the woods and documenting animal and plant life out there, kind of tracking it. Um, there's some great pictures. This is off of uh, Mike McCarthy's website. Um, it's a really cool project where they're kind of rolling up their sleeves and doing some first-hand data collection. And then finally, just to bring it back around to our librarians, um, Steve mentioned Makerspace. They've got this kind of structure that's not quite full-on Makerspace, which is kind of anything goes. It's a little more structured, but they're trying to have more inquiry-based um, types of activities going on in that library environment. So uh, on the left side here, this is this really cool project where they integrated with the biography project that kids were doing. So they were doing research. They created a little board game that has a circuit built into the board game that lights up once you finish the whole thing, which is kind of cool. So there's a little tiny engineering piece. And then on the right um, was kids were challenged to make their own, they learned about the Leaning Tower of Pisa. They had to make their own Leaning Tower. And here's some gentlemen who were actually quite successful. So it has to be, they had a height requirement and then it has to have a lean to it. So we were able to do both. Uh, I don't know exactly what the mention is, but they seem to be pulling it off. So a couple examples there of the types of things that are going on. Um, and I think it's, it's a good collaboration. I think <coughs> libraries everywhere are starting to shift um, away from kind of the type of experience that maybe I had at the library, which is you would go and check out a book and maybe listen to somebody read to you, and that was about it, uh, or do book research. Um, they still do that, but they're doing a lot of other things as well, and so it was this great opportunity to bring folks together um, to capitalize on all those new things going on. Um, first of all, congratulations on all the good thinking you've been doing. This sounds, you know, all of it sounds wonderful. Uh, the question I, I have is, I know we push the envelope here, and so sometimes we're looking at who else is doing something we can learn from. They are, where are So my question is, are there other towns that are as innovative and creative that we can begin to share and learn from? And we'll do the summer education, you know, bringing in other people who are trying to do what we're doing. Just because I think that, I'm sure there's a few out there that are trying to push it. Uh, and I, I just think that'd be great if we could figure out you know, in addition to our own creative people, are there others that we could learn from? Uh, I think that would be great. The data collection around Thurston sounds like a great thing. Mm -hmm. And I know we've done, in the past, collaborations with Hale. And I know years ago, they used to have a program after school, and my kids would come home, you know, they're tracking foxes or something. I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't, couldn't believe what they were learning just by having creative instructors out there. So I think building on that, I think there might be a lot of innovative things at Hale. To, you know, to go out and you know, plot an acre of land, everything that's there, that, that kind of thing. I think that'd be a great resource to draw on for that kind of, you know, reaching out to not just for animals, but the habitats and all that kind of stuff. But I think this is a terrific uh, effort, and uh, thank you. You know, think of other things we might be able to do to help you, but any other questions we have? Uh, no, I'm just amazed at the evolution of learning. Just, um, you're talking about fourth and fifth grade, and how much it has changed in the last mm. five years. Mm. It's tremendous. So, yeah, the, so some nice hard work there. They've done some great work. The ITCs and the librarians are really, they're the ones really pushing the envelope and coming up with some really interesting stuff. So. Is, um, is the idea that if we enhance this program in the fourth and fifth grade, that eventually the curriculum for computer science and engineering at the sixth, seventh, and eighth is going to be revised or looked at? Yes, um, I, I would say for sure. I mean, the, I think the key is is that common experience because uh, we've had a lot of coding, we've had maker spaces happening for, for several years now, and um, I think the grade three coding is a shining example of really looking at it from a district-wide, we want everyone to have this common experience. 
and we're working on that in grades four and five. And to your point, if if, if they're learning that much more, that's going to change um, what they come up to the to the middle school. It'll change. Right? It'll change the high school. It, yes. Yes. And um, you know, there's the. There are um, standards that the state has put forth. They are really pushing for new science, digital literacy, all that stuff. Uh, you asked about other schools. I would argue that Westwood is on the vanguard when it comes to a lot of this. Um, and you know, I, I think that it's um, I, it's really exciting to see where it's going to go. And, and in five years from now, um, you know, what kind of skills are our kids going to have? And, and how big is this program going to look? I visited the third grade about three years ago, and what was fascinating is high school kids were teaching the third graders. Right. They were so proud to have a high school kid. <laughs> the next year I went, and it was the fifth graders teaching the third graders, and somebody took a picture, it was my granddaughter teaching Tony's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so the second grader said, I got a big time, I got a fifth grader teaching me. Yeah. And it was, but you know, now, our high school robotics club has been winning all these. Is there any potential in the future, as we're thinking of innovative and creative things, to get take advantage of what those kids have learned and when they've learned it along the way? Maybe they had computers at home when they were in the sector. Mm -hmm. You know, to take advantage of that skill set that we have within the system, on how might some of that be, you know, made available in the fifth or sixth grade? I mean, I think there's a lot of that, you know, teaching within the system of kids. I think it might have a lot of potential. I think everything's on the table. And we've had success with that in the past, certainly something to look at going forward. Well, thanks, thanks very much. Yep. Thanks thanks you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to continue on here with the MSBA project update. Mm -hmm. So I included some information in your packet for you. There have kind of been two big things that have happened since our last meeting. Uh, the first is that thanks to Pete's efforts, we have submitted our maintenance and cap capital planning record to the MSBA, um, sort of a big deliverable for the eligibility period. So that's been submitted. We haven't heard anything back from them yet about that. So we're waiting to hear back from them, see if they have any feedback about that. It's an important document because that the information we submitted may have some bearing on what our eventual reimbursement rate is. It's one area where you can kind of get bonus points, so to speak, um, around how you maintain your buildings, and we think we do a good job with that, so we're hopeful that that will be fruitful. So fingers crossed on that. Um, and then secondly, you know, at our last meeting, we talked about the fact that um, Keith, Maya, Charlie, and I, along with some folks from the town, had gone in for our first in-person meeting with the MSBA. I said in my memo to you that that was in November. It actually was October 29th. But, um, and so at our last meeting, we decided that a couple of us, so Joseph, Keith, and I, would get together to further process what had happened at that meeting and think about what we needed to get back to the MSBA. So we did that. Uh, we got some good input, um, and we had a follow-up conference call with the MSBA this past Friday. He, Charlie, Maya, and I were on that call. So what they had required of us to finish out our eligibility period, we had to submit to them some very, very broad parameters for what we want to study in the feasibility study. And I had found that puzzling, and I had asked a lot of questions about that because I'm saying, well, how do we know that? Isn't that what the feasibility study is for? I think we got some very helpful clarification on Friday where we said, this is what we're thinking. And um, I think we were even getting too granular compared to what they need. They needed really big picture, which I found very reassuring. That made a lot more sense to me. So we um, have, have given them some information and they indicated that we had hit the mark. So uh, just to remind you, because our application to the MSBA was submitted for Hamlin, because you can only submit for one school, we were invited in for Hamlin. And so any eventual project with the MSBA now has to take care of Hamlin. They won't consider it if it doesn't take care of Hamlin. 
we had been told that once you get invited in, you can broaden the conversation and talk about other schools. That is true, and we have done that. What we now have clarity on, I think, is that the MSBA, in terms of their budget, and what the information we submitted to them, that they are able to um, help us out with a project that would take care of Hanlon and another elementary school. But I think it's equally clear that it would not take care of all three elementary schools. So the amount of funding that they have budgeted to help Westwood wouldn't take care of a project of that scope, which is good to know at this juncture. I, I would note also that um, to come up with one project that consolidated all three buildings, I'm not sure if there would be community will for that either. Um, so that's where we are. So what we have told them is, in the feasibility study, we would want to look at options that address the needs of the existing Hamlin School plus account for projected enrollment increases. And in fact, they're pretty clear that communities need to study that option, just taking care of this one school, so that we can really look at, um, look at the cost of, of that as compared to some kind of consolidation. So that would be one. Bucket. The other is options that involve consolidating Hanlon and Deerfield. And then the third would be options that involve consolidating Hanlon and Sheen. You can see Hanlon is in all of those. Clearly, there are a whole bunch of different possibilities within each of those three broad parameters. And that's what the feasibility study is about, is to start then thinking about like, well, what does that mean, the nitty gritty. Um, you know, and I keep saying to people, it's called the feasibility study for a reason, right? We may study options and think, that's a non-starter. We can't do that, or clearly this one's better than the other. Um, so with that, <clears throat> once we get voted into the feasibility study, we um, can start taking a look at that. And of course, that, just to remind people, is also the phase in which we really start the community engagement process, where the school committee develops the education plan with input from the community. Um, so that will be a big, a big, big process. So we gave them those three things, and with that, we've given them everything we need to give them for the eligibility phase. They told us that within the next couple of weeks, we're gonna get a letter from them that they call the design enrollment letter that will start to sort of memorialize all the things that we've talked about so far. We've We've done this on a timeline where there will still be time to have further discussions with them and engage in more back and forth if there's anything in that letter that we think doesn't match our understanding or that we're not comfortable with. And then we will, uh, we need to execute that letter. Once that happens, we can request to be on their February board meeting to get voted into feasibility, which would be a big, wonderful hurdle. So that's where we want. We also asked if we could use the work that was done on three <coughs> engineering work. They said yes, just update it. You know, so a lot of that, the buildings have, you know, that they haven't changed. You know, the, the pipes are still up. So, so there's a lot of work that already has been done that we could draw on. They said there's no problem with that. Yeah. We'd have to update sort of the cost estimates because it was four years ago. So, right. yeah. So that's important. Uh, I think we have a good foundation that we can build on. Um, so I don't know, Charlie and May, you're both on the call. Is there anything else that you think? No, I think that um, we came, at least I came away from the call, comforted by the fact that these three options are so broad that we'll be, well, my concern was even though we were solving for Hanlon, we have issues with the other schools, yeah. and I wanted to make sure we took a comprehensive look at all of the issues of the school. Mm -hmm. And I think that because our options are so broad and we did do a, um, you know, we involve every school in some sort of permutation yeah. that we are going to be able to do this sort of comprehensive look at all three schools um, to, to the best that we can. And that was really what I hoped we could do within this feasibility phase. So I, I felt very good about that coming up. And they are support, the support are very helpful. That was the suggestions that they're making, and I, I think it's a tribute to all the work that was done. Before, you know, they get started to where we are now. That uh, I'm only going to do a lot of credit for getting us to just have them looking at us as it's a realistic thing, and they appreciate all the work that's been done. So, I have um, I've updated the long-range financial planning committee, 
that's the group that kind of thinks, you know, big picture for the town, and also um, updated the town facilities task force. Tony and Carol were at that meeting as well. Um, and the executive function group, who are all the department heads in town, so everybody is fully briefed on where we are at this point. And um, we wrote a letter to the community that we put out on our school to serve to all parents. We published it in the town newsletter that I think has the people's mailboxes at this point. And it was also emailed today to the Western Wire to serve the town electronic filter. So we are, you know, making every effort to make sure that everyone knows what's happening with this process every step of the way. Um, the letter in order to make the the newsletter deadline, I had to write it before our conference call on Friday. So it's not quite the latest and greatest, but uh, that's what the video of this meeting is for. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. so, so maybe, so when they saw you solve for the Hamlin is in, I mean, obviously the redistricting is fungibility. Yeah. I mean, does it literally mean, I mean, there's 220 kids go to Hamlin. So, I mean, what is that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's no, not no. like literal, I mean, I just could try to understand. Yeah, no, it isn't literally it like one-to-one -one correspondence. Right, okay, okay. Kids yeah. get, no, yeah. not at all. Okay. Okay. No, not at all. So, I mean, really, they're just talking about, um, I mean, they're, we couldn't leave the current building there and then go do something okay. else, okay. right? I mean, okay. I get that. It's, it's got to include Hanlon. And when we say solve for Hanlon, it, it, they don't care where Hanlon is, right? So, very hypothetically, you could consolidate Hamlin and Deerfield on the Deerfield site, and they would still say that's the Hamlin project, right. as long as the Hamlin building doesn't exist. Yeah. And the other question we talked about preschool, is that out or is that, is that be Yeah. This? So they won't consider the preschool in terms of their enrollment okay. figures, enrollment. right? That's what the issue is. Now, I mean, one of the things that we've talked about is once we figure out all this, at some point we have a building and once it's our building, we can decide to do whatever we want with our resources, right? It, this is really about the design of yeah. And that's what's driving this whole process is the enrollment numbers. Yeah. yeah. And the amount that we're going to get from the SBA. And did we go back to the, our consultants? I mean, because there was a decent difference. I mean, it, it may not matter because yeah. we're going to SBA, but what did they, did they have any so, feedback? So we have not done that. We did get some input from um, you know, Tim Bonfati who um, has, his company has been the OPM for a lot of building projects with MSBA. He's working with Millis and Wells and Hoffman. And we sat down and asked him some questions and he said that he was not surprised to see that the MSBA numbers were different from the NASDAQ numbers. Part of it is apparently enrollment projections is like part art and science and maybe more art. But um, he also said that he has noticed that trend that the MSBA projections have tended to be a little bit higher. Um, I think they got permits, right, for one district? There may have been one district where, you know, they had to revise right. sort of too far down the road. So we may yeah. be benefiting from that um, at this stage. So at least at this point, they're projecting more than less is right. Yes. yes. Right. Or is better. Yes. yes. Higher than the yeah. 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 Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to mention one quick thing here, which is um, two months ago, you know, we said that the, we're not renewing the cell tower lease on the middle school. We have communicated that to at and They are aware. Um, if folks see people up there doing work on that tower, it's because within their existing contract, they do have the legal right to um, update equipment. And I understand that they're about to do that. So I just don't want anyone to think something's going on when they see that. That's all it is. That they're, that, yeah. And they they have told us that they would like to exercise that option, even understanding that we have told them we're going to break the lease. Or not, not break the lease, not renew the lease. Um, so that's that. And then I just want to acknowledge, if you didn't get to see the Rescue and Jessica webcast that was at the Downey School, was that yesterday? That was Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> I really can't keep track of my work. Um, if you go on YouTube and Google Rescue and Jessica webcast, you can see it. And it was a really wonderful event. So we had the authors and the illustrators of this book come to the Downey School. And it was a live um, discussion with the authors and illustrators with one of our kindergarten classes. And it was live webcast across the nation and even to a school in India. So there were like 600, I think, schools and libraries 
that um, were watching, and our kindergartners got to ask questions, and they asked fantastic. <laughs> so you should definitely take a look. It was it was really wonderful, and I want to thank Deb Gallagher for all of her efforts, and Steve, and our technology folks, because they had to deal with the somewhat high pressure, uh, you know, uh, logistics of figuring out how to do that. Thirty thousand viewers. <laughs> yes, exactly. And particularly to thank Jen Shea, who is a teacher at Downey, because it was Mrs. Shea and her kindergartners who communicated with the author, and they were pretty persistent, and we ended up being lucky, yeah, the lucky school. So thank you. It's a story. It is. It is going to be a newspaper story. <laughs> Yes. Uh, this is part of our program with public participation. Anybody here that would like to offer comments or thoughts, uh, we welcome you to do that. And uh, we'd like to keep it to a couple minutes uh, and just identify yourself and your address. If you, anybody here would like to publicly participate in our meeting? Seeing none at the moment, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, next item is discussion items. Capital and maintenance budget process. So I'm going to turn this over to Keith in a moment um, for this presentation. Um, I don't have clear. You're just going to have to tell me to oh, no, and I will, I will look for you. Um, so we thought it would be helpful tonight to talk a bit about the capital and maintenance budget process. And this is something that last spring we had committed to doing. There were some questions from the committee about sort of how we make decisions around capital planning. Uh, and so <coughs> we're here tonight just to talk about that process. And see if you have any questions. Okay, um, so obviously we're going to talk about the budget process. Um, the first thing I want to do, though, is to first frame this presentation out by talking a little bit about three items that are interrelated concerning the capital budget. And they are the long-term capital budget, which we call five-year capital plan, the annual capital budget, and the maintenance budget, which is actually <coughs> item in the operating budget under the operations department. So these three areas are linked. The way these three areas are linked has to do with two things identifying capital needs and available funding. So the way we identify the capital needs are we use a bottom-up approach. Building maintenance and operations department identifies the major capital needs that we have, as we'll see later in the presentation. These are used to build the annual capital budget, which is then used to build and adjust the long-term capital budget. Does that make sense? Um, the capital needs that are laid out in the five-year capital plan mirror the annual capital budget. Basically, all the categories are the same. It includes things like roofing, repair, maintenance, HVAC, and things like that. The other area that links these three items together is available funding. Now, ideally, if the town was able to fully fund the long-term capital plan, then the annual capital budget for the first year would equal year one of the long-term capital plan, because they'd be in sync. To be fully funded. If the funding of the long-term capital plan falls short, though, then what we need to do is prioritize during the next given year through the annual capital budget process, which is what we do every single year. What the maintenance budget does, though, with this is that it not only helps um, to maintain the capital investments that we've already made, but it also has historically helped to subsidize the shortfall in capital, because it's shortfall between what we asked for and what we actually received. So that's how those three things are linked. The long-term capital plan uh, is basically what I would call the ideal capital budget in a perfect world. Um, it's the total amount of funding we would need to replace all of our capital items on an ongoing basis other than the buildings themselves. And that's what we put forth in the uh, long-term capital plan. The way that's developed um, within the long-term capital plan is basically based on life cycle cost. And for the larger areas, like roofing, for instance, what we do is we take the total square footage of all the roofs, we multiply it by what we call an anticipated replacement cost, and it, then we divide that by the uh, life cycle. So we plan on getting at least 25 years out of the roof. And so when you do that, you wind up with funding that you need each year to put aside to replace your roofs on an ongoing basis. So 
going forward. Um, so a little more used to the annual capital budget because we're dealing with that uh, lesser funding. And so that budget process is happening all year long. Um, as a result, our priorities, as a, you know, as a result, the priorities change during the course of the year. Uh, basically, we live and breathe the capital budget all year long. And an uh, example of this is like two weeks ago, by machine, we lost uh, our air compressor. So we needed to replace that. You know, a few weeks before that, we had a flood at the middle school. So we do our best to try to keep ahead of these things, but capital stuff is happening all the time throughout the year, which adjusts our priorities as we move through the budget. So the capital budget process itself consists of five steps. We gather a lot of information, we prioritize our projects, we estimate our costs, we identify available funding from the town, and then we finally we finalize and submit the capital budget to you for your approval. The information that we gather is uh, multifaceted. We use buildings and grounds inspections, uh, what's called the facility condition index, which I'll talk a little bit about. We use work orders. Uh, principal requests during the annual budget process, as well as we identify any current time initiatives that are going on. The building ground inspections. Our facilities are inspected uh, basically using an outside in approach. When we start with the grounds, we take a look at fencing, the, uh, curbs, pavement, all that. Then we look at the building envelope, look at the uh, masonry, the windows, roofs. And we work our way into the building down to the um, basically the HVAC systems and the mechanical systems throughout the building. Building inspections are um, ongoing with a lot of inspections. The director of operations, Ken Aries, and the assistant director, Greg Baldwin, uh, do at least seven um, inspections, not seven, they at least do two inspections of all seven facilities during the course of the year. They probably, in fact, do, do seven inspections because they're always in the building. Um, but the building principals also participate in at least one of those uh, visual inspections. And we use contractors to inspect um, various components of our buildings, as it, as it says up there, boilers, rooftop units, roofs, emergency, <coughs> systems, elevators, um, anything you can think of we have inspections happening. Because uh, we want to make sure that the buildings are safe from all those things. Our maintenance staff inspects our buildings regularly, and they're a great source of information, especially for items that um, they give us heads, heads up on, uh, whether or not they're going to be failing or going to be in place you know, in the next budget cycle. Our town insurance company also does an inspection, Maya, and points out any potential issues that uh, they might see. Uh, town departments also conduct inspections, including the Board of Health, Fire Department, as well as the building department. So we're doing a lot of inspections, which is great. Um, now, the facilities condition, in, uh, condition index is a process that we use as part of the capital process <coughs> to identify uh, things that we may need to be replacing in the upcoming year. Uh, it's basically a system where we gather information on each individual component. So uh, it's not only like a full HVAC system, system but say at the Market Jones, we actually have you know, the boiler at the Market Jones, we have pumps and all the major components of that system. <coughs> and we, and uh, we track things like, as you'll see on the side, we track things like uh, life expectancy, replacement costs, current condition, the remaining life. Um, this is very useful information when we build a capital budget. Um, to keep track of this stuff. And the next slide is just another example of circulating pumps at the various schools. So we can keep a good eye on the major performance systems using the system. Next piece of information we have is through work orders. Principals, teachers, as well as all the operations staff can submit work orders. Um, maintenance staff schedule what we call preventative maintenance work orders for boilers, gym events, filters, oiling pumps and that sort of thing. Um, this does an excellent job of ensuring that the longevity of our building systems. The next slide is just an example of our, um, our program that we use. We use school do for our building uh, maintenance um, work order system. And one thing I should note here is that um, if there's something that our maintenance staff can't do, um, let's say it's a plumbing work order, then this system actually will send this to our plumbing contractor directly. And we're able to get that work done 
that's going to be responsible for the system, which is great. This is also great information if you have, if we see repeated work <coughs> for a particular area of the building or a particular unit, so that tells us that maybe we need to think about replacing that unit coming up. Principal request um, is also more information we see. This is, we usually see this during the annual budget process, where when principals uh, submit their request, um, it's usually for program needs, for example, moving walls, adding electrical outlets, uh, things of that nature. And they're prioritized along with the operations uh, requests coming in. I should know that, I should note that I have here Mr. Sean Devon, I believe, holds the record for most walls moved in a building. With <laughs> 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 Josh, this is one a close second. <laughs>
that okay. makes uh, 38, 57. So 38 gets you up halfway. 57 gets you all the way to the library. Yeah. Uh, 2001 gets you the pink hallway that goes yes. down toward the 112, 113. 2010 gets you the, um, oh, no, I, I missed something. 90, no, 90, 97 was yeah. the pink hallway. Yeah. Uh, 2001 is the modulars on the front. Right. 2010 is the right. modulars on the back. So, the risk assessment is quite different. Like yeah. The, <laughs> it's, like <laughs> the it's like the Frankenstein. Of the yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we're also thinking very carefully about how we're investing in capital money. Now, you, you may have noticed that um, she and Deerfield and Cam are up there, and I know that we're in discussion with the SBA about those three buildings. But these, to us, are three safety issues that need to be done. And I just want to assure everybody that we're going to be maintaining these buildings until students are not in them anymore. So safety is a more priority for us. So we're going to keep this the buildings up. Now, capital budget versus the building maintenance budget. As, as we've talked about, capital budget has historically been underfunded. And just to give you an indication of what that means, because um, we did talk about the long range capital plan. For this year, our request for the long range capital plan was $1.77 million uh, to fund that ideal capital budget. We received 867 so there's a shortfall of like nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So that's why every year we go through cap the annual capital budgeting process so that we have to buy prioritize with money that's available to us. Is your five year outlook rolling? If you roll it every five years or is it we do, we roll okay. every five years and we adjust it. We adjust it based on what's happening within within the vision. Um, that's where the building maintenance budget comes in. It helps to complete projects um, if funds become available during the current year. Um, building the maintenance budget line itself, I mean, the main purpose of that line is routine maintenance, of course. Um, we also fund emergency or health and, health and safety projects out of that line, as well as current needs and future needs that funds become available. And as you can imagine, from the routine maintenance, um, things like, it includes things like all um, oil and water treatment, mine plumbing, carbon, and things like that. And the emergency and health and safety project, these projects represent the majority of the overages in that budget. A good example is the, um, uh, the air compressor that we just replaced. So that was an emergency item. We just had to do it. We, you know, we have to fix things as they break or as things like that happen. Examples of these for last year would include um, the replacement of three exterior staircases <coughs> last year uh, in the modules. So during one of the routine inspections that we did, we discovered that one of the staircases was in poor condition. We checked the other two, which were in a similar condition. So we decided to replace all three of the staircases during last year. And that wasn't budgeted for, but that did come out of the building maintenance budget because it's a safety issue. So we need to get that done. Um, also last year, we did a lot of plumbing and filter work regarding the um, really drink. <coughs> uh, and I want to say again, we take health and safety projects very safe, seriously, and we'll get those done no matter what time of year it is. Current needs to be <coughs> projects um, that might not be health and safety issues now, but they may become health and safety issues later on. Like, for instance, if uh, there's a torn carpet and we try to repair it and then it, it just keeps on degrading over the course of the year, we may just decide to replace that whole piece of carpet, the carpet, the whole thing itself. Same way with other flooring type things. Also, program needs come up under current um, needs. Things like uh, if, there, if we need electrical, like we see a lot of the science stuff going on, if we need to change the output somewhere, then we do that. So that helps with the program. Um, also, underneath this, um, I added here, um, I came out of the building maintenance budget last year with design work for the elevator. Now, we need to get that work done immediately in order to have that bid out over the course of last year. Um, so we had to put that under building maintenance, even though the, the funding for the actual elevator came out this year. So, just to mention. Under future needs, um, again, if funds become available, we looked at the capital items that need periodic replacement from our capital list to see if uh, we can check them off in this current year. Examples of this would include projects such as additional paving and masonry, flooring, or even oil replacement. That's a fun thing to do. So that is the capital maintenance for the process. Do you have any questions? Pretty thorough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
tease out one thing, I know we talked about this before, so this, this issue with the fact that the maintenance line in the operating budget sort of historically is overspent. And, you know, I think what that really reflects is what, what he uh, was talking about before, the fact that the capital budget historically has been underfunded as compared to the needs. And so, you know, knowing that the needs always kind of exceed what we have budgeted, if for some reason due to say turnover right, or something that was underspent towards the end of the year, um, money becomes available, we say, well, what could we spend that on that would be a good investment that reflects the priorities that we've already identified, you know, and that's why we put it towards things like maintenance projects. We put it towards other things too on occasion. It may be that there are like curriculum materials that we need or we know that um, we need new textbooks and whatever. And if we can take care of it now, we don't have to have a budget increase for the following year to take care of it. So we think about all those things. But I think that maintenance is a place that we often do put that kind of money if that flexibility arises because we know we have these needs and they aren't. Um, it's an easy go-to. It's an easy go-to. Yeah, and it's not going to go away. And obviously that money, I mean, because school budgets are um, voted as bottom line numbers, we have that kind of flexibility to kind of spend it down to zero in a given year, and that allows us to make those, those investments. And that's not uncommon in other districts either. Any other questions? Thank you, Lee. Um, it's a little bit related to the earlier conversation. Uh, is there anything big let me ask another way of is there anything big because you only get so much funding in here and there's i get there's a lot of little things mm -hmm. but i guess it'd be, not today it'd be interesting to know if there's anything big if we're going to be at thurston for a while right is there anything big we need to be thinking about because it, we may not be able to do it with it's just another question yeah no i think that's a good question yeah. we were thinking about those okay. kinds of things uh, definitely yeah. Yeah, we also explore um sometimes the town is able like they provided us with additional funding Capital funding from the elevator, they may be able to buy funding like that. So, yeah. We're having some of those conversations now. Like, is there a big, glaring project? Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, um, you know, the town sometimes is able to say, well, rather than increase the base, could we pick off some of these projects? Right, that was the elevator, right? Yeah. And yeah. Funny, they gave us money for the roof. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Or yes. The, um, yeah. the network yeah. upgrade is another example of like that. Yeah. And, and we're having some conversations now. So, for instance, one of the things on Geek's list was um, we need to. We need. Oh, I, yes, that. Phase one of the Univents, which is related to the middle school. So, that's really thinking about how are we going to make sure that the HVAC you know, right. <laughs> continues to function effectively for the long term. I was even thinking about paving at the high school. I mean, you know, that's like a $100,000 project. And, you know, so we're, we're talking about is there a way to fund that kind of thing, which is clearly about the high school, but also about community use. Mm -hmm. right. right. And it takes the pressure off the end, so, so we're able to do more for the end. In the fields, do, do the town is historically funded, like the turf, is that something they fund as opposed to yes. like turfs in the yeah. ground? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's another good example, right? I mean, that the turf's going to have to be replaced on the multi-purpose field yeah. fairly soon, I think. Yeah. And that's part of the discussion that, um, policy that you voted into uh, guidelines. So you remember that the policy piece directed the district to then work on guidelines. So that work is now complete. And so tonight what we've done is given you the document that the working group uh, created. And the opportunity tonight is, uh, I'm going to give you a quick little overview, but also to engage in some dialogue uh, so that we can determine our next steps, which I have some recommendations what we could do. So, um, as you recall, it, the district policy um, directed us to develop a working group and hear from multiple constituencies about this topic. 
and then produce some guidelines. So I, I want to say that we were able to produce the most lovely committee ever. They were great. Uh, we have a member here, so thank you, member, for coming. Um, but I just want to kind of give you a sense of the scope of the different constituencies represented, because I think that's a good starting place for this conversation. So um, Allison joined us, just lovely. It's wonderful to have her as the assistant superintendent. Keith joined us from the business facilities, HVAC, thinking carpet, think of all of that stuff, buses. Ken Aries joined us from facilities. Um, and that's really, really, really an important cons constituency to think about for this topic. Deb Gallagher was our principal representative to get the voice of the principals um, present about how does it really work in the schools on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Benicio Corone, who's the food service director, attended every single meeting and was thoughtful and went back and did homework and came back because school food is obviously quite an important topic as well. Ellen Nadeau is our Downey School nurse. She represented the nurses. So Ellen and <laughs> Deb are like our tag team Downey um, group. Um, Carol Lewis is our school committee connection. Uh, Polly Attridge is a parent. She's here tonight and she's awesome. And we had two other parents who are not here tonight. So I'm not going to share their names because I didn't want them to ask the permission. We also had a student representative, a high school age student, and she was fabulous. And she had great so um, I hope that just from kind of reviewing that, it gives you a sense of the scope of this topic and the importance of this topic, right? So that group met three times um, over the fall and produced the document that you have. It's a guidelines for the management of life-threatening allergies in the Westwood Public Schools. And Charlie, I hear your voice in my head sometimes, so I want to just let you know that Situate, Cambridge, and Nauset Public Schools are our foundational communities that we built out of. And um, one of the wonderful things about um, that important perspective is that because we're members of the same policy development group and it's an online policy manual, we have access to all the town public school policies on any topic, it's searchable. So I reviewed many of them, these were the three best, recent, comprehensive, and then you're, you can use them. So that's a really important reference point. So they formed our backbone, and what you can see is that um, the, the approach is essentially you go constituency by constituency, and you achieve consensus on what the guidelines are for each working group of people. So in this case, students, parents, school administrators, school nurses, teachers, food service, bus company, <coughs> athletic director, custodial. And then you basically work and work and work until you have enough of a consensus that you can agree that these are our um, consensus-based agreements about what we are trying to do. This is not a um, perfect document and it's also built to be adjusted over time. So at the end it says who to call if you have a question at a school, who to call if you have a question at the district. Um, and it's a, a living document because this is a topic that evolves over time. Um, there are also individual student needs and building type needs and district needs related to this topic, so different people would respond to this. Um, the three themes for this document are clarity and consistency around roles and responsibilities. So who does what? What happens when it's um, a question? Who do you go to? Things like that. That's important. Um, I would say consistency among the schools and communication proactively is another big theme and probably the focus for this document for us as a district was just consistency across the different schools. And then this idea of building a culture of proactive planning so that you're not showing up the day before the field trip to say, is it okay if we go here? You're thoughtfully connecting with families, you know, in advance as much as is appropriate so that people can kind of problem solve together and brainstorm together and we can build that culture then everybody wins. So that's the tone of the document. Um, I do want to just say quickly that everybody has always worked in really good faith on behalf of kids in the district and that was evident on the committee level that people spoke up honestly and gave good feedback and questioned and I think we have a nice outcome because of that. And this really is an opportunity to continue to improve clarify and get student voice into this, and I'm very appreciative that we were able to do that. So you have the details. If you have anything that is a specific question, I'm happy to answer it.
Yes, please. Um, so as the mother of a child, now, yes. Um, so two questions for you. In the field trip section, it talks about ensuring that the medication goes on the field trip. Um, what about chaperones and ensuring that if a nurse goes, I mean, if a nurse isn't able to go on the field trip, that a teacher or, or a chaperone is, you know, trained to do the EpiPen? Or, is yep. that in? Yeah, that's in there. And so the, the language is something along the line of um, ensure that there's a EpiPen delegated, trained person on a field trip. Oh, okay. Yeah, so there's a con contingency for almost any possibility. Um, and that, what do you know which responsibility that's under? No, nope, I can look for you in a second and tell you. Nurse. Maybe the nurse. I don't remember. Related to that is what about kids who are going to be in China or in France or in, you know, mm -hmm. uh, South America someplace? You know. So we did not address like the specific of every instance. Um, so we have something that says, for example, okay, it says uh, ensure proactive awareness of students with LTAs in planning all school-wide events, and then it says field trips. Ensure that all life-saving medications instructions are taken, right? Yeah. Right. But to answer your question, I think you would have to figure out in an instance of that what Sometimes we're not responsible for some traveling, but it's still so you know, our kids that if yeah. we have something we can do. How whoever's doing the trip. Yeah, I think, well, yeah. yeah. You know, right, that's for, the next goal. You know, I think that's know, in the school. You know, what's in the food. So I think this one says it all. We're happy to look to make sure we've addressed what you're asking. Okay. I think it overlaps across multiple different jobs. And okay. I think this idea under field trips of ensuring that all life safety medications is linked to the fact that there has to be someone, someone delegated exactly. to give the life safety. Okay. Um, and then my second yes. point on the Director of Food and Nutrition Services. Now, in full disclosure, I haven't looked in a long time, mm -hmm. but when I went on the website to pull up the menu, mm -hmm. and then, you know, they, there's the chart, the allergen chart. Yeah. It didn't line up with the menu itself. So there were items on the menu that were listed that were not on the chart and vice versa. Yeah. And I think just making sure there's a consistency there, and there may be now, but, um, I, that was a big problem first. You know, you just, yeah. you didn't know if the chicken nuggets were the same thing as the chicken dinosaurs. And it was, confusing. yeah. So we discussed that. And there are certain moments where you can see that like the food delivery truck arrives and there's been a substitution of what the item is. And so the thing that we published doesn't match. Mm -hmm. And we talked about what the human kind of safety net is for that from the nurses to the principals to calling parents. But what we tried to do to capture that is we had something in here that says, you know, recheck routinely for potential food allergens so accurate ingredient information can be communicated with parents. I don't know that we are ever going to get to a point where we can catch every unexpected change fast enough for right. every single situation. But what we're trying to do is build a consistent awareness that they should check at least, you know, on a reasonable basis. And if it's drifting too much, then that's the kind of thing Heath would have to step in and say, you know, if you have to do it weekly, you have to do it. Okay. It's, it is a moment in the calendar we, we learn from parents that there are days when it doesn't match. Um, but in almost every instance, there's been some attempt to get to the family to say, what's your second choice? Sure. And what's your third just, choice? Yeah, are you saying that it does, what's being served is not on the menu, or are there two no. things within the um, software, within what you're looking at online? So I printed out, let's, so I printed out the, the menu for April, right? And I looked at all the choices for April. And then I went to the website and said, okay, on April 3rd, it's these chicken nuggets. And on the website that has all of the allergen information, chicken nuggets were not listed. They weren't an option. So you didn't know what ingredients were on in the- To double check them. To double check them for the okay. April 3rd date. Okay. So it wasn't, I'm not sure it was a substitution issue. Right. Um, it was more just an inconsistency in what was published in the menu versus what the list of, you oh, know, it, it just seemed to be two, from two different companies. Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So just making sure there's that. And I think we'll have to combine as we go. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess from my perspective, uh, the guidelines are um, something we'd like to roll out to principals and all the different constituency groups 
this winter and begin using and testing out and finding these kind of moments and saying, how do we refine this and refine that? Does that sound good to you guys from your perspective as community? I, I think that that's where we could be left with there. Hopefully we would be able well, thank to Thank you for that. organizing. Just like this, I don't know if it's possible, maybe you might want to write a letter. Just to thank you and all these people. Just to acknowledge all this multiple. So, I mean, I, I think it's a great example. I don't know if it's, this is for the future, but I've always been concerned about health and safety in many years. But the one yeah. I'm talking about now is, is in athletics. Now, I used to be a youth hockey coach. And what I found out was when a kid falls down in the corner, the referee says, it's your job. My job. See, your job is to go out on the ice. And, you know, it's not a doctor. We don't have trainers. Even at the high school, the trainers aren't at every practice home. So we, we hired a doctor to teach the coaches. So he comes out and says, well, if the kid's bleeding, this is what you got to do. If the kid is unconscious and he's not, you know, he's not breathing, Bleeding, breathing, and then finally, if he can't move, you know, and so he said, what am I get myself into? Because this is, and you know, lacrosse and football, these are all concussions, kids can, so I, I don't know if it's worth beginning to look at our own guidance to our coaches. Well, I want to clarify that all of our coaches receive that training. You can't coach for us it, unless you have had the, that first aid training, if you're CPR certified, yeah. and all of that stuff. Um, they're trained on the use of the AED, yeah, we wouldn't, we wouldn't allow people to coach for us at that point. Uh, yeah, sorry, you went through that because that's very stressful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, we, had to, yeah. we had to teach our own coaches, <laughs> yeah. but I, I, I had no idea how, uh, you know, what yeah. the potential was that uh, in the needing you have at the basic level, you had to have people to know what to do. And, uh, and well, thank you for You're welcome. Well, and this is an ongoing project. It's not something that's over by any stretch this evening. And I did reach out um, to the Recreation Department, and, and they're very interested in, in um, reading these and learning more about this topic as well. So it's been a nice community connection. So thank you for um, giving us the go ahead. And we will start tomorrow. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The, uh, the next uh, is action items. Yeah. First, I approve the minutes from our last meeting. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Second. I have one amendment. Oh, yeah. One amendment. Um, so, on the third page of the minutes under MSBA projects, about halfway down in that paragraph, it said we had budgeted 31%. We, we haven't budgeted anything. I would say we had we anticipated, maybe even hoped for would be better, <laughs> <laughs> but we haven't budgeted anything. Motion to accept that amendment. Some second. second. Okay. All those in favor, change the yeah. Okay. On the overall minutes, we have a recommendation to approve it. A second. All those approve the minutes themselves. Okay. Our next item is the China trip extension. So you have previously approved this particular trip to China. Right. Um, but as you can read in the memo here, um, there is a proposal to add an additional day of travel to that trip. And it's because the trip organizers have offered this opportunity um, at no cost to extend the trip by a day and participate in this one day US-China High School Exchange Summit. co sponsored by Primary Source, which is a fantastic organization that we um, deal with. So I think it is an exciting Second the uh, extension. Mm -hmm. Mr. Brooke, are they in Siena they gonna visit the Terrible Warriors? Uh, I well I have to say I can't guarantee that, but I would imagine. That would seem like a big miss yeah. Yeah. to not do that. So I, I, don't say that. I just say it. I will check. I give them about a half a day to uh, yeah. to Beijing and the, the Great Wall and the Sumi and I would they let them have these things. Yeah. I'll check on that. <laughs> so the next item is the Model UN Overnight Trip. Yes, um, so you've approved a lot of trips. These Model UN people are traveling all over the place, I've noticed, and having a lot of success, uh, I understand. So the information is right there in your packet. Um, right. This trip, it's only to MIT, but it involves um, an overnight stay, which is why it's being brought to your approval. I'll move to accept the Model UN Overnight Trip. Second. Second. 
And uh, just any questions? Uh, you know, there are uh, chaperones from the teachers uh, on the overnight trip? Or? Well, listed here. So it's yeah, Chris Hilton, who is the advisor, and then Susan Pizzialco, who's a parent of one of the students yeah. in the model. I, did, I didn't put this in here, but they had one trip that you did approve fell out, and this basically replaces that. Sorry, there was a trip yeah. to UMass that the organizers were not doing a good job of, and so Chris, uh, Mr. Hilton, asked to swap this out. So this effectively takes the, takes the place uh, for a trip. Sure, that you I mean, like when the kids do this to get like a 200 word report on what they learned, what they got out of it. I can ask. So that would be nice. That we could share maybe. I would love sure to have them come and show. They did a they did a really nice kind of event here in the building where I got to participate in a model UN event. It was really pretty exceptional. So I well, maybe they could speak for us, yeah. but or maybe at least something writing for other kids who don't want it to sure. maybe yeah, benefit. About that. Yeah. Well, I think we we already approved this. Okay, next item. Okay, so some exciting news here. Um, uh, yeah, so tip of hat to Mrs. Lewis, who yeah. said at the last meeting that she would um, pursue some, um, some funding for J term, which is very exciting. Um, as we talked about last time, because we didn't have an accurate understanding of the cost of J term when we budgeted for this year, we're a little short, and so this is um, going a long way for filling that gap. And so. We have received a $5,000 donation from Debt and Savings and a $2,500 donation from Needham Savings, which I think is because President of Debt and Savings reached out to President of Needham Savings and asked if um, community banks, they could kind of work together on this. So um, because they are of a substantial amount, we need to vote to approve those gifts. And though we don't, technically don't need to vote on this, uh, I do want to mention that we also have an, uh, a company called the Leaders Environmental, it's out of Needham, I believe, and they kind of unsolicited every year send us a $150 donation where they say to use it in any way that we think would benefit students. Right. And I got that check today. It's a Looters Environmental. Oh, yeah, like a lawn service, right? Um, yeah, a lawn tree and shrub care company. And uh, so we certainly appreciate that gesture and that ongoing support. And I got that <coughs> letter today, and I thought, let's put that in the change room. Uh, <laughs> Kitty as well. So uh, so we have three gifts, Dunn Savings, Native Savings, and Homer's Environment. Okay. Uh, just uh, who would make most to support this, uh, accepting the gift? Second? Those, those are. I obviously will send thank you yeah. letters to all of those. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, Carol, thank you so much for jumping yeah. into yeah. 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 it. I think this, you know, uh, I don't know whether we get into this, but the J-Term thing is so innovative, and we're doing a lot of innovative things. So I, think there, I think there are people out there willing to fund learning what we've done, you know, where we write it up and share it with other groups. And I, I think, I, I don't know if it's possible to to see if anyone is interested in funding Westwood's sharing what we've learned, all the detailed stuff that went into planning it, and all the evaluations. But I, I think other towns might like it. And I think somebody might want to fund us to share what we've learned without using up a lot of time. We have been sharing for free, I will say, right now. So um, a couple of weeks ago, we actually had a team of administrators and teachers from Grafton School approach us, and they came and they spent half a day here and um, met with us and they had already done some research online about the program and we met with them and talked about our experience and kind of gave them some advice. And the best part of the day was that um, the Dean of Students just went into the library and said, hey, I'm looking for some students who will come talk to these people, anybody available right now? And probably, I don't know, 12 to 15 well, yeah. kids. So, you know, a random sample came on in and we just let them answer questions, and it was fantastic to hear what they had to say. About I think you did ask if the media center could share with us the, yeah, yeah. the presentation. Yeah, right, the presentation. We had 10 of them and sent it out. But, yeah. you know, I, I think if there are parents who have a little spare time to want to be on a committee, because they did so much evaluation right there, yeah. it's just a matter of putting it into a document, you know, and say, this would like to share this, and to raise some money that way, and, and, and other innovative things that we just heard about tonight, the, uh, the coding, and, you know, with the cutting edge, why not we get a grant to 
support it. You know, so anyway, that's thank you so much for reaching You're out, very welcome. Yes, showing the, us the, the way. I'll put a plug in. The community banks are are just that. They're all about communities, and, and um, our reputation as a school district really <coughs> precedes us. And they um, so I, I know there are other banks out there that would be willing. And they said thank you in the newspaper people too. Yes. Yeah. 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 We did that. Wait, it's going in the paper? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't sign off on that one. <laughs> the, uh, next item, appointment of Supreme... I got Court. The Supreme Court representatives for the collective bargaining team and, uh, uh, for the school committee representatives. <laughs> so Seth is going to give us her many years of experience, but I'd love to do it, uh, yeah. I think we'd like Tony maybe to join and That'd learn from the experience you gained and sure. uh, that with other personal clothes. The second, that the new search for our director of business finance search committee, uh, I'd ask uh, Carol if you would be willing to uh, thank you for helping out. Uh, do business liaison reports, any things that I just have one thing. Tony and I have been sitting in on this group. It's just a heads up for people. The town is beginning to revise its 2000 health, the 2000 plan for the town. Right. And these are the subjects that we're going to be writing up. If anyone has an interest in these, they'll be looking for input. Land use, town centers, housing element, economic development, natural and cultural resources, community facilities, open space and recreation, transportation, Resilience and sustainability. So, where did this list come from? Okay. This is the town has just appointed a committee to start planning, developing a Westwood plan in these areas. The last time it was done was 2000. So, there will be people going over public hearings, meetings, asking for input from. But the, what this document supposedly is used for is for committees in the town, selectmen, all of these to, to use this as a reference in their planning. But just a heads up that that's happening. Anybody interested in these topics, they're about to be worked on, revised, and updated. I actually just um, this evening got an email from the folks who are working on the community facilities report um, asking about meeting with the school department and they would also like to meet with some school committee people to talk about our building needs and so that they can incorporate that into this conference. Okay. Any other Updates for any committees that people are working with, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I, mean, we received, I just want to say we did receive correspondence from uh, Citizen Today. The Bottom Church Hall saw the uh, study, the crime breaking study about start times. We talked about this being kind of a goal two years ago, so I think maybe it's a future meeting. I'd love to talk again about um, that topic. Sure. Okay. Now we're going to talk about it again on the agenda. Yep. Great. Anything else? Uh, okay. Uh, we are, and I'm going to have an executive session yeah. uh, to discuss some things that are. Like the bargaining that yeah. just the committee will be here for that. Okay. Thank you everybody for coming. Appreciate it. I think, I think, I think you've done moved to adjourn to the next session. Oh, yeah. so I'll make that motion. Adjourn. Second. Adjourn. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>